Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Endocrine Society's virtual Endo 2020 news conference on thyroid health. My name is Jenny Glenn Gingery. I'm the Associate Director of Communications and Media Relations here at the Society. We're very pleased to have with us Dr. Raymond Douglas of Cedars Sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles, California, Zoe Quant of the University of California, San Francisco, and Dr. Maria Papaloyontu of the University of Michigan. Before we get started, I'd just like to go over a few housekeeping announcements. Um, we do have all attendees muted except for our presenters just to avoid any background noise and distractions. Um, when we get to the Q&A portion, we do ask that every, every, all the journalists type their questions into the chat window, and then we will go ahead and address those during the Q&A. You can type them in before we get to that portion. Um, just be sure to include your name and your affiliation with your questions. Uh, please note this webinar event is being recorded and is going to be available on our YouTube channel and our website following the presentation today. Uh, so over the next 35 minutes, each speaker is going to present their findings and then we'll end with the Q&A. I'd now like to invite our first presenter, Dr. Douglas, to speak. Uh, thank you very much and I hope everyone can hear me fine. It's really my pleasure to present today the effect of tepratumumab on proptosis reduction across various demographic subgroups. And I do this on behalf of the authors, Dr. Kahaley, Dr. Smith, uh, Robert Holt, and Saba Silla. And so, next slide, please. I have a financial disclosure that I am a consultant for both Horizon Therapeutics and Immunovant Incorporated. Next slide. So, thyroid eye disease <clears throat> is associated with autoimmune thyroid disease, predominantly Graves' disease and it's characterized by inflammation and proptosis with a significantly altered appearance and vision changes that you're going to see in some slides later on. It's caused by an autoimmune overactivation of the thyroid stimulating hormone receptor and insulin-like growth factor one receptor complex, and this is on orbital fibroblasts. This complex and activation of this complex triggers a cascade of inflammatory signaling, which includes release of pro-inflammatory cytokines, but also the overexpression of glycosaminoglycans, such as hyaluronan, and proliferation of the fibroblasts and fat and muscle expansion behind the eye, which causes the characteristic physical changes that you will see. Next slide. Teprotumumab is a fully human monoclonal antibody that binds specifically to the insulin-like growth factor one receptor and it's an inhibitory molecule. It binds to the IGF-1R TSHR signaling complex causing internalization and blocking of this signaling uh, complex receptor. It halts the signaling of this complex at the source um, where there's overexpression of the IGF-1 receptor, namely the orbital tissue. And it causes reversal of the orbital tissue expansion and the higher on end production characteristic for this disease. And it's the first medication now indicated for the treatment of thyroid eye disease. Next slide, please. This is a summary of two trials, phase two study and phase three, that were very similar or close to identical in their design. They're both two 24-week randomized double mass placebo-controlled trials testing to tepratumumab versus placebo. You can see that um, 88 underwent randomization in phase two and 83 in phase three. And eventually, and what I'm going to show is the combination of this data, the combined data over these two trials amongst many centers. Overall, 76 patients completed the double mass treatment period with tepratumumab compared to 79 completing the placebo period. Next slide. This is a very important slide because it shows the crux of how this drug, how effective this drug was in treating this disease. Proptosis is when the eye bulges, and it's the characteristic finding of thyroid eye disease. It's the cause of the facial disfigurement and even the blindness that's associated with this disease sometimes. A reduction of two millimeters or more in proptosis is considered a very clinically meaningful uh, uh, result and has never been seen with other drugs in the past. This was the responder rate as far as the percentage of patients who achieved at least a two millimeter reduction in proptosis. And this drug is given every three weeks. And you can see at 
0.6 weeks, over 55, approximately 55% 55 of patients already had a response to tepertumumab. This was the minimal criteria for response. You'll see that proptosis was actually reduced further, but this then went on to reach nearly 80% of the intent to treat population at week 24 receiving a response. And significantly, the number to treat of patients was 1.6 in this, in this, with this treatment. Next slide. The, what I'm going to show you is a subgroup analysis uh, looking at both smoking, U.S. versus European centers, age, male and female dominance. And what you can see in the center portion of the slide is the treatment difference from placebo for proptosis responders, meaning the percentage of people who responded to the drug versus placebo. And the further you are to the right is the more that they responded to tepratumumab compared to placebo. And you can see overall the responder rate is just as we discussed in the high 70s. Uh, next slide. But you can also see that smokers versus non-smokers had a similar, though tobacco users had a much broader uh, range of, of improvement, but also but both groups benefited from this drug. Next slide. You can also see that both the European centers and the US centers, which were roughly equal, both these patients benefited from the drug quite significantly. And even older patients versus younger patients who sometimes have slightly different characteristics of disease, both benefited um, likewise from the disease. And so did male and female patients. Notably, this occurs more in female patients, but male patients are often more severely affected. Overall, demonstrating that this really provided improvements in proptosis across all subgroups. Next slide. Most importantly now is not only did we meet the minimum criteria with tepratumab improving proptosis, but the proptosis reduction continued to improve. You can see from week six to week 24, reaching a maximum of about a reduction of 3.1 millimeters. Now, just as a comparison, I'm an orbital surgeon, and that's about what I would achieve by doing an orbital decompression or removing the bone behind the eye, the bone that separates the eye from the brain. So you can see that this is a very significant improvement um, with a the medical therapy. Next slide. And this really highlights the effect that patients see in the mirror, and you can really only surmise the beginning of what they experienced in this improvement of their quality of life, which was also demonstrated in these studies. In the above clinical photographs, you can see baseline versus 24 weeks of placebo not much changes in this disease without definitive medical therapy. In the lower set of clinical sides, you can see patient treated with tepratumumab. At baseline, this patient was beginning to have the earliest signs of losing vision, and it was really at a potential risk for losing vision due to this disease. You can see below after 24 weeks what the significant improvement was of medical therapy. This has really been unheralded, unheralded in comparison to other medical therapies previously offered. Next slide. Overall, tepratumumab provided an improvement in proptosis. We saw a proptosis responder, but it's really paralleled here in this slide, just for clarity and completeness, demonstrating, next slide, that tobacco users and non-users had a, almost a three millimeter reduction in both uh, tepratu in, in tepratumumab treatments. And in addition, next slide, both the European centers, older versus younger patients, male versus female patients, all had a very significant and similar reduction of, of approximately three millimeters or more in some of these subgroups, demonstrating that really there doesn't appear to be a particular population where tepratumumab doesn't improve the proptosis, but it seems to be improvement across all subgroups. Next slide. The safety is really important in this medication because we wanna make sure that it's a safe and effective medication. The treatment adverse events are seen and serious adverse events were higher in tepratumumab. Two were considered related to treatment, a diarrhea and infusion related reaction leading to discontinuation of the study and Hashimoto, Hashimoto's encephalopathy possibly related to the study drug leading to interruption. 
the one patient, the placebo, had progression to optic neuropathy and vision loss and had to be removed from the study. There were very um, an occasional report of an anti-drug antibody, but really just in two patients, one at study day one and another at week three during the 24-week assessment period. The day one patient was also positive at 72 weeks, but this appeared to be relatively um, very uncommon. Next slide. The treatment emergent adverse events occurring more than 5% of the patients are shown here. The muscle spasms were, were relatively well tolerated, usually occurring at night and simple massage. There were no electrolyte abnormalities. The nausea, diarrhea, fatigue were associated usually immediately after the infusion for a couple of days and were well tolerated. Of note, the hearing impairment was more of a, of a plugging of the ears in my assessment and evaluating these patients, and almost all of these patients improved, and this was, uh, and all of these effects were improved after the discontinuation of the drug. And they were all considered mild to moderate in intensity. Next slide. So in conclusion, these two placebo-controlled studies really show that temperatumumab reduces proptosis, also double vision in the clinical symptoms of inflammation in patients with active TED, which it did not show, but while proving that it's really clinically meaningful improvement in their quality of life, as you can certainly see from the photos. And the, the temperatumumab reduces proptosis regardless of their baseline characteristics of age, gender, or smoking status. And this drug was approved by the FDA for the treatment of thyroid eye disease uh, in, on January, in January of 2020. And again, thank you, and thank you to my co-authors uh, for allowing me to present this for you here today. Thank you so much, Dr. Douglas. Um, I'm now gonna invite uh, Dr. Quad to speak. Um, hi, everybody. I first wanted to say thank you for allowing me to talk about my research today on behalf of my co-authors. Um, I will be talking about using the lecture Electronic health record to understand thyroid immune auto related, sorry, thyroid immune related adverse events following immune checkpoint blockade. Um, next slide. So I have no disclosures, um, but two of my co-authors do have some, none of which directly pertain to what I'll be talking about today. Next slide. So immune checkpoint inhibitors are changing the landscape of cancer therapy and have now have FDA approvals for multiple solid and liquid cancer. There are patients out there who had metastatic cancer, but are now in years long remissions. Um, despite this efficacy, these treatments are accompanied by a unique type of side effect, next slide, called immune-related adverse events. As you can see, these can affect pretty much every organ in the body. Um, so while thyroid dysfunction is usually very easy to treat, an untreated patient can feel pretty awful and have bad effects on their heart, bones, brain, and more. So as an endocrinologist, I view my role as the part of the support team that enables our oncologists to continue to give these treatments when necessary. Next slide. So we sought to better understand the real world experience with these treatments by using the electronic health record or EHR. So first we identified all the patients who had been treated with checkpoint in inhibitors at UCSF. There were about 1500 of them. We then linked this data to our cancer registry to determine what kind of cancer each patient had. We excluded participants who had thyroid cancer. So that left us with just over 1400 subjects. At that point, we used labs and medication prescriptions to define thyroid dysfunction, and again, um, excluded anyone that was found to have pre-existing hypo or hyperthyroidism before starting checkpoint inhibitors. That left us with a final sample size of just over 1,100 subjects. Next slide. So interestingly, using this approach, we found a much higher percentage of patients who developed thyroid dysfunction than we were expecting. So as a background on the right um, hand part of the slide is the data that came from a meta-analysis of clinical trials and suggested that 6.6% .6 of patients developed hypothyroidism and 2.9% developed hyperthyroidism. 
as a little more of a background, the typical course of this disease is that patients either develop an overt hypothyroidism on its own or a progressive hyperthyroidism to hypothyroidism. So these percentages are not mutually exclusive from each other. Um, in contrast, on the left-hand side is our data. So we had um, found that over 19% developed thyroid disease of some sort, so much higher than the um, meta-analysis had shown. And to further drive this comparison home, um, the 13.4% of our participants had hypothyroidism and 9.5% had hyperthyroidism. Again, not mutually exclusive from each other. Next slide. So prior studies had shown that rates of thyroid dysfunction differed by checkpoint inhibitor type. And surprisingly, we found that this difference did not reach statistical significance. But instead, we saw that, that cancer type was associated with the development of thyroid dysfunction, even after adjusting for taking into um, checkpoint inhibitor type into account. So you can see that these rates develop or ranged from about 10% to 40% between different types of cancers. And next slide. Um, so in summary, thyroid dysfunction following checkpoint inhibitors is, appears to be much more common than was previously reported in clinical trials. And this is one of the first studies to show differences by cancer types rather than type of checkpoint inhibitors. There's a lot more research to be done um, to better validate case definitions and replicate these findings in other electronic health records outside of the UCSF system. Next slide. So finally, I just wanted to say thank you again to my colleagues um, on this project as well as the other projects that I am working on um, as well as to my funding sources. Thank you so much, Dr. Quand. Um, I appreciate your speaking and now I'd like to invite Dr. Hi everyone and thank you uh, to the Endocrine Society for inviting me to present our study. Uh, I will be presenting this on behalf of our co-authors which are listed here and the study is focused on physician management of thyroid cancer patients worry is it good enough. Next slide please. None of the authors have any disclosures. Next slide. So differentiated thyroid cancer is the most common endocrine malignancy and it affects approximately 50,000 Americans every year. However, the vast majority of these patients do have a favorable prognosis and the five year uh, survival rate exceeds 98%. Despite this excellent prognosis, we have previously shown in this study that uh, in a diverse cohort of 2,215 patients with differentiated thyroid cancer, that thyroid cancer-related patient worry is common at a diagnosis and may somewhat persist two to four years later. Or specifically in this study, 88% of patients reported a diagnosis that worrying about their thyroid cancer made them feel upset, 63% that it made it difficult to uh, carry out their daily activities, and 45% that it made them feel distant from family and friends. Next slide. So despite the fact that we know now that thyroid cancer-related patient worry is prevalent, information on strategies that physicians use to manage this worry is lacking. This is a qualitative study of 31 patients with papillary thyroid cancer who were interviewed prior to surgery and also uh, several weeks and months later. So what this study showed is that the uh, perception or the statement that thyroid cancer is a good cancer was elicited unprompted by 94% of the participants. And even though the patients appreciated the optimism, they also stated that it created some negative feelings of confusion and guilt and that it invalidated their fears of having cancer. Next slide, please. The objective of our study was to understand physician management of thyroid cancer-related worry. We did this by surveying endocrinologists, general surgeons, and otolaryngologists who were identified by patients from the Georgia and Los Angeles SEER sites in 2018 to 2019. The physicians were asked to rate in general what their patient's worry was at diagnosis, and also to uh, state what action they took if their patients were worried. Next slide, please. We had a, a remarkable response rate at 
and a 93% cooperation rate. So the response rate was calculated by dividing the number of respondents by the response eligible physicians, and the cooperation rate was calculated by dividing the number of respondents by all physicians who were able to be contacted. Next slide, please. As you can see here, uh, overall, 42% of respondents were endocrinologists, 30% were general surgeons, and 28% were otolaryngologists. More than half practiced in a private uh, practice setting, and also approximately one-third of physicians that responded stated that they only took care of 10 thyroid cancer patients or fewer in the past year. Additionally, overall, 65% of physicians reported that their patients were quite too very worried at diagnosis, 27% that they were somewhat worried, and 8% that they were a little not worried. Next slide, please. These are some uh, statements that were reported by physicians to be used in order to reassure worried patients. So the overwhelming majority stated that they do provide details on prognosis, including details on recurrence and death to their patients. About 60% of physicians stated that they tell them their doctors are experienced in treating this cancer to alleviate this worry. But uh, 50 or 49% of physicians also stated that they tell their patients that right, cancer is a good cancer. Next slide, please. Uh, we subsequently conducted a multivariable logistic regression analysis to determine the factors that were associated associated with telling patients they, ha they have a good cancer. So covariates we used included physician specialty, practice setting, CR site, years in practice, volume of thyroid cancer patients seen in the last year, and also the perceived worry by the physicians at time of diagnosis. So as you can see here, otolaryngologists were more likely to use this terminology compared to endocrinologists Private practice physicians were more likely to use it compared to academic setting physicians. And physicians that uh, were, uh, uh, that practice in the Los Angeles SEER site compared to Georgia were also more likely to, uh, to report using good cancer. As expected, physicians who perceived that their patients were quite or very worried at diagnosis were less likely to use this terminology. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, what we have shown is that more phys most physicians uh, report that they perceive patient worry as common at the time of thyroid cancer diagnosis, and that they report addressing this worry with different strategies, even though uh, some of the strategies may be counterintuitive and counterproductive, such as telling patients they have a good cancer. Um, we're still exploring uh, what the benefit or or no benefit of such strategies on patient outcomes will be um, going forward. Next slide, please. So just finally, I wanted to thank the physicians who responded to our survey and also to their patients who previously shared their worry. Um, this work would not have been possible without them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Papalionto. Um, I'm now gonna open everything up for questions. Um, again, if you have a question, please type it into the chat window. And if you could identify uh, the institution you're writing for, that would be really helpful, media outlet you're writing for. Um, let's see, so we already have a few. Dr. Douglas, I have a question for you from Marie Benz of medicalresearch.com. Um, she asks, does tetrotumumab work on myxedema of thyroid disease? I know that's usually seen with hypothyroidism, not graves. Well, it actually can be seen with Graves and, and certainly a subset of patients uh, typically seen in the calf and as far as in patients' feet. Um, it is much more uncommon. And so we don't know the answer to that uh, quite yet. Um, certainly an anecdotally, it appears that it can, but we just don't quite know the answer to that at this point in time. The mechanism would appear to be the same. Uh, there have been skin fibroblasts have been shown to overexpress the IGF-1 receptor in patients with Graves disease. And it would appear that blocking of this mechanism would likely lead to an improvement. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Douglas, I have another question for you from Regina Schaefer of Endocrine Today. Uh, she asks, can you talk about why the sub-analysis for tepropotumumab was stratified by smoking status? 
why does smoking increase the risk of developing thyroid eye disease and how does smoking worsen outcomes? Yeah, and I apologize for uh, not making that more clear. So in thyroid eye disease, smoking is one of the core contributors of turning this into a, a relatively moderate disease into something much more severe. It has been associated with worse disease outcomes, worse disease, more optic neuropathy, and a, a poorer response to even anti-inflammatory treatments. It, it appears that probably the <clears throat> reasons are diverse. Smoking certainly appears to preferentially cause fibroblasts uh, in the orbit to increase pro-inflammatory cytokines, and this could be what links into the, the clinical and um, outpoint uh, outcomes that we see. But nonetheless, uh, we certainly know that smoking is a huge factor. It's one of the first things we advise patients is to avoid smoke and tobacco use of any type with this disease. So it's reassuring that this medication does work because most other medications are much less effective uh, in even in reducing some of the inflammatory signs uh, when in smoking patients as opposed to non-smoking patients. Great, thank you. Dr. Quant, I have a question for you from Sherry Roan at Everyday Health. She asks, does anyone understand why the thyroid gland may be more susceptible to adverse effects from checkpoint blockade drugs? Um, so there's a few different mechanisms that have been proposed for the different types of adverse uh, effects. And one of them is that we have an underlying autoimmunity to a particular organ <clears throat> that's basically kind of controlled, like we, ha we don't have manifestations of it yet. And that's particularly true for the thyroid. We, have, uh, we know that there's a lot of people that have thyroid autoantibodies and um, yet don't have clinical thyroid disease. And so one of the theories is that these patients basically with activation of the immune system are activating an underlying predisposition. My guess is that that doesn't explain all of the, um, all of the thyroid disease that we see because not everyone is autoantibody positive with the classical autoantibodies. Um, so other possibilities could be shared antigens between the thyroid and the tumor site um, and um, other auto-inflammatory reactions. Great, thank you. Dr. Papaleonto, I have a question for you from Kristen Monaco with MedPage Today. She asks, do you have any suggestions for alternative terminology doctors can use besides good cancer to reassure these patients? So I think that's a great question. And um, unfortunately, I can't say that I do. And I think that um, it is really more pertinent to educate patients in terms of what the actual prognosis and recurrence risks are for differentiated thyroid cancer. And we know there's a spectrum. Um, but, um, you know, remember in our first study, these were all patients who had favorable prognosis. So basically, you know, negligible risk of uh, death. So I think it's just, um, there's, there's a lot of influences um, towards the patient and what the perceptions are. And we also know that risk perception varies among different groups of patients. And it also may be influenced by things like symptom burden or social support or, you know, family members, et cetera. So I think it's just, um, trying to lay out the, um, the evidence instead of calling uh, something one or another. Because I think patients who do have thyroid cancer, um, at least in clinical practice, do mention that they sometimes feel invalidated by calling this the quote unquote good cancer. Great, thank you. Dr. Quant, I have a question for you from Miriam Tucker with Medscape. She asks, what's your hypothesis about why you're finding so many more cases than previous studies did and why the differences by cancer type? Um, so I think that some of the reason that we're finding more, more cases than previous studies is that once we're actually using these drugs outside of clinical trials, the restrictions on um, giving them to patients with other autoimmune diseases have been lifted. And so my guess is that some of this is just that as we give it, give it to a broader population, we're seeing more of these results. Um, probably 
the other aspect is that in the initial trials, um, people weren't quite as aware of the possibility of certain side effects. And so we're now doing many more labs. You basically get thyroid function tests with every infusion of, um, and so I think we're probably catching more patients who develop disease. And then in terms of why the different cancer types, that's definitely one of the questions we're looking into more and trying to, you know, pick some of the outliers in terms of groups that don't get more, do, um, do get get more cases to try to understand. I think one possibility is the other treatments that patients are getting. So particularly for renal cell cancer, um, some of these patients have gotten tyrosine kinase inhibitors, which can also cause thyroid dysfunction. So perhaps those patients have already been exposed to that drug and then they get put on an immune checkpoint inhibitor and, and so their thyroid's a little bit more susceptible um, and then I think the other possibility is that shared antigen that the thyroid is overlapping with some of these diseases in terms of what, what is activating the immune system. Terrific. Thank you so much. Uh, that's all the questions we currently have in the queue. Uh, if anyone else wants to pose a question, please type it in now. Um, I would really like to thank all of our fantastic speakers and journalists who took time to join us for today's discussion. Um, as a reminder, these news conferences are going to be available in our online newsroom and our YouTube channel. Uh, if you have any additional questions or you'd like to set up an interview with one of our presenters, please contact us at media at endocrine.org. Um, and we hope everyone will also keep an eye out for more announcements about our virtual meeting that's going to be happening in June, Endo 2020 online. Thank you so much again for joining us today. Have a great one. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.